So we enjoy facilitating these workshops and we enjoy doing our landscape designs. And our designs aren't traditional landscape, ornamental landscape design. We weave and blend together conservation and permaculture, um, eco-psychology, horticultural therapy. We kind of blend a lot of different worlds together, including ornamental uh, landscape design as well into our work. And so currently at the time, our project in Ann Arbor that we're working on is um, in Plymouth, Michigan, just next door. And it's a 13 acre vegetable, organic vegetable farm that is having um, kind of a rewilding conservation update throughout it, along with um, creating an agricultural entertainment space. Um, and then we are also working with a local apple orchard, which is owned by the same woman and creating a conservation easement trust along with some permaculture design gardens and again, agricultural entertainment mixed in. Um, so our specialty when it comes to working with the land is on broad scale landscapes, um, big picture landscapes to like, you know, 10, 20, 40, 100, 400 acre <laughs> projects really. Um, and that's been there's, our main there's, also the projects in, there's also the projects in Detroit too. Yeah, so we also have a couple of food forest projects, community food forest projects that we consult on and are designing in Detroit and Ann Arbor. Um, and we're really excited about those this year. Through those projects and then our bigger scale project, um, we've been inspired to start a small nursery to not only stock our own projects, but to stock um, edible and native food crops for our local region. So those are things like our native mulberries and pawpaws and red buds and uh, hazelnuts and chestnuts and all the kind of things that are a little bit more difficult to find but are infused into holistic perennial food systems that are really the way to go so that we can be you know, way more resilient than hoping that our lettuce seeds take and our radishes are good and we don't get too much rain or too much dry creating these perennial resilient systems is definitely our passion and focus. My background is landscape design. It's uh, uh, conservation, long-term long conservation projects, uh, community-based ones, uh, conservation alliances, teaching ethics at uh, Southern Cross Uni. And, um, and so Bridget and I have gotten together a few years ago and now we deliver a range of innovative workshops around the around in Portugal in the UK in the US India possibly Argentina later this year was going to be a plan um, and we manage and design large projects so obviously resilient projects require knowledge of plants but also people's values and mindsets and how you organize yourself so you know it's all very well to say we want a nice farm or we want a nice community project but actually behind it is what are the values what is the organization what are the aims? What's realistic? So we, we kind of see ourselves as people who take people's projects and aims and desires and dreams and make them clear and then make them happen as much as possible. So we're in, we're in the business of making these things come true. And unfortunately for a long time now, we've been believing more and more and more that they were in a very precarious situation, very precarious. So a couple of years ago, we basically said, okay, we just need to get out there and teach teach workshops and be quite innovative because we are living in a very precarious situation and that precarity is has just now revealed itself even more clearly than we ever hoped it would we never really hoped it would be we didn't want to be right put it that way but uh the work all, all the work of permaculture and resilient community work and regenerative culture and agriculture suddenly has become People say, oh, what are you going to do for a living now? We kind of go, well, this is what we trained for. <laughs> this, this, We've been preparing we, for this for I, our whole lives. <laughs> we we didn't, didn't want to be right, but we, we no. Um, so, yes, we feel we're in position to share ideas. The other thing, just one more thing, is what Bridget and I have also done in the last few years is deliberately drive around all sorts of parts of Europe and the UK and the States and Australia looking for projects which are successful and trying to learn from those projects. So what works, what's interesting, talk to the people, learn from those, acknowledge, and then attempt to weave that through our workshops and, and projects. You both feel a kind of sense of enormous relevance at the moment, given what we're confronting. Uh, is that what you're sensing at this point? 
yes. Well, as I said before, people keep on saying, what are you going to do with yourself? You know, do you have any work? And it's like, oh my God, apart from the projects we already had happening, uh, we, can, we can see projects starting to, um, projects and advice and consultancy and free advice. Uh, once we're organized for this lockdown in both of our different, we are in different parts of the world now, unfortunately, we're in the US and Australia. Once we're organized, we feel like we have a lot to offer but we need to just um, you know, hunker down, get our systems in place, and then we'll be in a position to, to offer advice, consultancy, ideas, inspirations, support, encouragement. And one of the things we are, we are, there's a few points we'd like to make in this little talk. One of them is that most of us knew that we we're in a precarious system and it has shown itself to be very precarious, but many of the solutions already existed. So many of the, sorts of projects we went and visited, we visit regularly that we love seeing. We're so inspired by a successful nursery or a food forest or a conservation project, or even just, I mean, I just got all excited by seeing mushrooms coming out of a straw bale and photographed it and put it on Instagram. Nobody else thought it was very interesting, but that regenerative uh, approach to life, the cultivating life to approach to life as, oppo as opposed to exploitation is what it's all about. So there are all sorts of different initiatives, projects, people that initially need acknowledgement and support in all the ways. This is a sort of the second point we'd like to make. Because you've worked with a lot of projects, both of you over a number of years, um, those projects that relied on complex networks connecting together to try and deliver something to a community uh, in whichever context. What have been some of the kind of shortcomings of, of some of those initiatives when, when you look back on them in terms of their ability to, 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 to deliver? Mm. That's, that's a good question. Over to you, Bridget. Yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind is a poor social system design or social structure design. So poorly managing and designing how the people fit and work into the system and maintain the system and care for the system, like where the inputs are, where the outputs go, all that kind of nitty gritty behind the scenes detail work. Um, if that is not done thoughtfully, um, a beautifully designed system will fail. So it doesn't matter how beautiful the garden is or how perfect the plants were picked out or how um, well designed the farm layout is, if the people systems are not well designed, that is a recipe for disaster. There's ways to kind of fumble through it for a while and you know, for a lot of people, it's easier for them just to have a very small group that they're working with so that you can kind of manage those things a little bit easier. Um, but really to create a holistic, resilient system, you need a community and you need a, a large group of people to make it really thrive, not only to be the producers, but you know, to be the consumers, like the whole system of it. Um, so I would say people would be designing people systems, social structures would be the highest priority. Second failure which relates to the first one is that quite often the projects we uh, we see a lot of projects which aren't working as well lots of initiatives that aren't working and yeah. it's often beca often because the aims are quite uh, based on a whim or some kind of sentiment mm -hmm. it's often naive mm -hmm. so um uh, if you know what your aims are and your goals and they're realistic and then you can create an organization that's going to work towards some kind of a goal and then you can find just your, your staff members who or, or your or your community groups or your way you structure things so clarifying the goals social structure and then the third critic then would be skill i think which maybe bridget can talk about yeah, yeah. i think um on this you know all of these threads it's it's um if you're not real clear with what you want and what you need out of something, you know, you're not clarifying the aims, then how are people going to know what to do? Um, and if you're not able to find people that have the right skills to do the work, then you need to train them. And whether you have the skills to do that or not, or you need to bring in consultants or specialists or people to train and to skill up your workforce. You know, one of the biggest threats we see to most projects and when we turn in a report, one of the, when we put threatening processes, section on there to let them know like what the threatening processes are for this particular project. The first thing that we've started always having on the top of that list is unskilled workers and untrained workers. So if you don't know how a system works, how are you to maintain it? And if you're not offered the training and the skills to, to do that, then you know what's going to come of it? If the person that has that skill isn't there, 
you know, if, the, if there's only one person that can do it, then you don't have a holistic system. You don't have a backup plan. Um, I'm going to jump in with a fourth um, kind of shortcoming of many projects is that even when they're very successful, they're not acknowledged or supported sufficiently. Mm. So often there's fantastic projects around and almost no one knows some, you know, a bit like that sustainability elders project we were talking, we were working on before Richard, people quietly plonking away in a back in a nursery back somewhere. And there's, you know, they have almost no social, social media presence and they're, but they've learned so much. So, you know, even the successful projects are often suffering for lack of, uh, lack of um, acknowledgement. Uh, and and the sh and the sharing that can come from that. So I, I think that's four good yeah. points. Yeah, these good systems aren't being supported, and we're um, just building, you know, new systems or um, trying to reinvent things instead of supporting existing systems. It's like I I've been thinking about this a lot this year, living in the states and watching the millions of you know getting into billions of dollars being spent on campaign ads, on advertising and marketing. And I think in every state, you know, they, you know, there's over $50 million spent in just the Democratic bids in the state of Michigan. And like, what if all of that money, you know, was distributed to nonprofit organizations, like all these little, like every organization I know could benefit from $5,000 or, uh, you know, okay, the lack of I... funding and finding value. It's, you know, yeah. to me it's like this lack of understanding the value in a system that maybe isn't turning out a profit, but yeah. it's creating people, you know, capital and values and resources. Yeah. What, what does leadership in terms of bringing these networks together look like? Shall I have a go? Yeah. I think um, um, leadership, leadership comes from consulting widely and under, understanding who the players are in the field and what, what the situation requires. And it requires some kind of experience and expertise and, and, and a bit of courage. Um, it requires a plan of some sort, even if it's emergent, as a planning process and an organizing process. Leadership always, to, it is pretty interesting that nearly every successful project already has some kind of outstanding leadership person, couple of people or group to it. I mean, the most successful projects that they have some kind of very driven, almost obsessive person at the center of them. You think of any project which lasted 10, 20, 30 years, you'll say that's been driven by so and so and so and so, so and so and so and so. So, leadership and strong characters is very, very important. Mm -hmm. People who act out of, they have a conviction around something, and it's not too too driven, but it's a conviction, and they really act upon it. They don't get pushed off their course easily. Yeah. Okay, and leadership well, also is also reaching out to other groups and yeah. giving kind of a pattern. Uh, suggest, suggesting a way of working together. Right. right. How, do, how do you seek to ensure that, you know, the community you're working with is somehow representative of the wider community? It's not just inviting people to the table, but it's asking questions. It's taking time to listen. It's taking time to be in the community and talk to the people that you're trying to serve. And, to, um, you know, and right now in this time of kind of, in intensity and rapid change, a lot of people are just speaking up for what they need. So businesses around here are adapting to what people are calling them and asking for or sending questions to them about. So I think that um, that's kind of the, you know, the pathway that's, um, that we need to, to follow at this point. Let, let's move, let's fast forward then to what's currently happening in, in Ann Arbor. And, um, and one of the things I remember, I remember from my rapid fire conversation with Charlie around all this was the amazing sense of connection, both virtual and otherwise, um, between the participants of these particular initiatives and networks and, and how quickly those networks have been able to mobilize around food supply and, and how creative, co-creative thinking has played a key role in generating a, a very rapid response to a need, which is very urgent, isn't it, currently? I just wonder whether you could speak, speak to that. Well, I think a lot of it boils down to, we have an incredibly strong local food scene here that's been building for decades. So, you know, this movement, organic farm movement started here in the 70s, for sure, if not earlier. 
with some local farmers and uh, some cooperatives that were set up. And it has been uh, cared for and facilitated. We've had farmers markets in um, the neighboring towns in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti my whole life. I grew up going to them. Um, so, you know, I've always known a handful of local farmers and it's always something that's been really important to this community. We are, um, you know, a mega university town or set of towns. There's multiple universities between the towns here. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of people coming and going and a lot going on. A lot of our industry has disappeared, um, which sets its own challenges, but the local farms and local food scenes have only been growing and building rapidly to the point where like, I can't name all the local farms anymore. And when you look at the local resource list that was just built this last week by um, Michigan State University Extension Office and the local food summit organizing team, um, it has over 20 farms on it that have signed up and are ready to do online sales and distribution along with mul multiple businesses that uh, sell focused, have focused their sales on local food products um, and have all set up online and different ordering. Um, so what was interesting is right before all this happened, every year we have a local food summit and, you know, it's not always like the, the have to go thing for the content, though the content is really beautiful and valuable and they did a fantastic job this year. Um, but for me, it's kind of the end of winter social outing where we all get to see each other and we're a group of people that see each other year after year, our friends, you know, we see each other at the markets, we visit each other's farms, we you know, know each other. And so we had all just had our, our meet up right before this happened. So um, I think this is, you know, we live in a particularly unique area here. Um, and the response really comes from the people asking. And also the farmers around here are really passionate about what they do. And they <laughs> all have their spring crops going in the ground and in their, you know, propagation houses and they're all ready to roll. And so they have all amped up their um, production and all of the places, um, one of them being Argus Farm Stop, which is a, kind of a seven day a week farmer's market where the farmers can sell their produce and they get, um, farms get 80% of the sales, Argus Farm Stops get 20%. Um, and then they also have a coffee shop which helps support the business as well too on, on all at their locations. Um, and they have made huge initiatives and strides um, to get their online sales up and operating and pick up immediately within the first week. And they have, they, along with some other farms, one of them being a farm called White Lotus Farm, um, they are a large um, Buddhist community that has a farm that does animals and breads, um, you know, they have goats and they have cheese and dairy and breads and um, vegetables and they have brought in a bunch of local farms and started selling all their products so that the farms that don't have the ability to set up online sales were able to join into these co-ops, these collaboratives of farmers. And now in this last week, three more regional uh, kind of farmer collectives have come together um, in different parts of the towns so to facilitate different neighborhoods so nobody has to go too far and they have a lot of resources on hand. So you don't just have what one farm offers. You've got maple syrup and you've got butter and you've got vegetables and you've got herbs and fruit and bread and all that coming in one box um, that you can pick up and order. And I've tried ordering through the, all these Kroger and all the regional supermarkets um, to get a delivery service or even a pickup service from them and you can't get through. There's no, the line is so long that I can't get an order I delivered. So when I go onto these local farmer sites, I can place my order immediately and pick it up within a few days, whatever their delivery or pickup service offers. So that's been a valuable resource for me to also feel more secure. Um, but I know it's helped a lot of other people as well too. In a very short space of time, I mean, these existing networks and, um, and productive processes have, have really kicked in at this time of crisis, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah, it's been incredible to watch and to see. And we have a weekly um, phone phone in meeting that you can go to uh, to run through the Michigan State Extension Service. Uh, and it is, you know, um, it has got all kinds of um, great information for the farmers market folks, for the farmers, for cut flower growers, for the you know 
nursery industry, like they're just kind of collaborating all the information and bringing it all to us in kind of one package. And then also being able to have conversations about what's working and what's not and what initiatives are going well and you know, how we can, how we can all keep operating and keep working. So, so the key to this appears to be a kind of ac active networking role, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, the woman and, who organizes those Tuesday conversations is a powerhouse in organizing local stuff. And her job is paid through um, the Michigan State Extension Service. Uh, it's a you know, funded job where she helps connect farmers with resources. So her, that's what she does, is just making sure that all our local farmers have access to the resources that they need. What's your sense, Charlie, about what Bridget's been talking about, what you've witnessed yourself in Ann Arbor, about the, the, the short-term effectiveness now, well, the short-term in terms of the immediate response to the crisis, about how that's working out um, in, in, in Michigan? In Bellingen? No. Well, either, either in uh, Ann Arbor or in Bellingen. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's the same in both places, essentially. So you have a kind of an activist un subculture network, which is there all the time, bubbling away conservation projects and community projects and food growing projects and food processing and, and kind of farms and small scale capitalism and, and it's bubbling away, bubbling away. And currently it's just suddenly come into its own. It's, re it's ready to jump into a new situation. So mm -hmm. what everyone was predicting would happen in some way or form is unfortunately happening at a pace which is absolutely frightening. And anyone who's organized and has you know, good initiative at the moment is able to come forward and offer their services, whether it's farming or community care or, or, or whatever. And organizations are able now to hopefully adjust to further support, to, to scale up, to adapt to the new situation. So adapting to social distancing, for instance, what a terrible phrase, but that's what it's called. And then the next stage is then for people to find whatever gaps uh, are, are not coming forward. So what, what are some of the gaps between, between existing services? So, but m much of it is existing systems, existing people, existing organizations, get behind those. They're already waiting to jump to the fore and that's what seems to be happening. So in Bellingen, something similar is happening. I, the other day I was driving, I'm still working on a tree planting project some of the time and I drove past a kind of semi-spontaneous farmer's market. And they said, well, we think we can operate. And the, and the food that was there was unbelievable. Some of the best food I've ever seen grown in Bellingen. And right. wow. I got there just before the market opened and I, I drove back again about an hour later and it was a frenzy of people. Right. I also right. know that there's co cooperative farming systems here, farms, organic farms, which have attempted to be profitable and relevant for years suddenly now there are so many people working there shareholding working on different plots at a distance of course the local one of the local community gardens is now got plots left right and center you can't buy seeds or seedlings in town yeah, yeah. so this kind of um bubbling away kind of thing that's underground has just come to the fore now what's Bellingen has also got now is, I think it's fairly innovative, is a, is a, is a Bellingen Shire COVID-19 neighbor, neighborhood care network, which has sprung to the fore. So not only are food growers quite active here, the health scene is very active here. They formed a testing, uh, testing area, a drive through two weeks ago, way, up, way ahead of anybody else, that local doctors created. Uh, the local neighborhood center, the doctors, the council, have all now got this network. So anyone who wants information, it's all up in the papers, on the web, it's in town. So it's a very active, and places like Byron, um, Brunswick, Ann Arbor, Bellingen, all very similar. They have quite active towns. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, you know, that, yeah. that's one kind of scene and it's, a, it's definitely coming. To, I wonder what's happening in say, Kempsey or Grafton right now. I wonder how that's going. Rebecca Solnett's book, um, Paradise and Hell, which talks about a lot about how communities respond to uh, traumas and challenges and crises. Um, and you can see that bubbling up in a lot of these communities. You know, we too have a mutual aid organization that is connecting everybody with the resources they need and trying to make sure that good factual information is getting out. And 
Um, and you're starting to see more organizations, like I've never seen so many farms or so many different businesses say, okay, we're going to band together. How are we going to do this together so that we all can survive? You know, the, the restaurant industry is obviously treading water. The cut flower growers are, you know, you know, the flowers are still growing. <laughs> it's just, they can't sell them. Um, so I think there's um, more of a, a unity that's um, growing amongst organizations. That's really beautiful. And something that I think I, and I, can, I hope I can speak for Charlie in this, that we've um, desired to see for a long time studying permaculture you're taught that you know these are whole ecosystems these are whole systems that work together and if the whole system isn't working together or a piece is missing or um, something is coming in and damaging that system breaking apart that network then your system's going to fail and it's not going to thrive and create abundance and so we also one of our main points of what we're seeing in the places that's working is that you're taking a whole system approach you're not just providing food but you're giving good medical advice. You're, you know, having people check in with community members. You're having people get groceries for other people or walking dogs for folks that can't. It's about taking care of the whole system and the whole person and um, the whole community. It's not just about making sure that one person has, you know, their stockpile of toilet paper and, and pasta. You know, that's, that's not the priority here. The priority is making sure that we're all cared for. And so to me, it's beautiful to see these things. It's unfortunate it's taken something this tragic to bring it to life, but it's, it's good to see that it's, it's happening and people are starting to become more aware of how important it is to work on things collectively. So I think, you know, if, if you go to Norco right now, and you talk to the, the, the women selling the seeds and seedlings and things, they're frustrated because they're saying, well, everyone's coming here and bought everything, every orange tree, every spinach plant, every seed, even if it's in season or not, and 80% of those things will die because people don't know how to grow them. So that's, you know, some people will do very well and some people will learn very, very quickly. So what people are often doing by buying seeds and seedlings is actually, it's, it's, a, it's a sense of place, it's a sense of safety, it's a sense of belonging. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm moving towards here now is once people, hopefully the system will, will stabilize in this system and not deteriorate into the next levels of disaster and the next, that, that is possible, when was the last time two million people put on the unemployment queue so quickly? That's just one, we stay, part of one assume, country. <laughs> yeah, that's right, in Australia. Assuming things do stabilise at this kind of level, people, and Bunnings stays open. Many people right now are just going to Bunnings and, and fixing up their kitchens and dog runs and, and plants and so on. The next challenge is, of course, mental health. So a whole system approach is a whole, whole person approach as well. So uh, what can we do to um, support people in their places? If they're stuck indoors in an apartment, you know, one, one of the things we also uh, are keen to offer to people is, is how do you make places healthy and abundant and good energy? You know, a couple of indoor plants is healthier for you than none. A window with a tree with an azalea outside is healthier than none. Um, how do you make your places supportive, healthy, clean, if you can just pick a few herbs to add, add to your daily healthy tea from outside, that's a good thing. So, you know, even though we do tend to work on large scale projects, this all can be applied at all scales. And, and yeah, so the mental health, sense of belonging, sense of safety, sense of community, the irony of connectedness. I mean, I'm, I'm here on the edge of suburbia and three cars pass a day at the moment. No. People, yeah. people are out on their bikes, um, people are in their gardens. Uh, but it's also, it's a bit shocked. There's it's a, sh a sense of shock and silence in the air too. Like, what do you do? Yeah. We're so used to running around like headless chooks, chickens. You know, what do you actually do now? <laughs> yeah, there's, there, there's a, a joke that the per capita sourdough bread making ratio has increased by a hundred fold in the, last, in the last week everybody can't buy yeast at the store so they're like oh i guess we're gonna have to make sourdough it has many other spin-offs in terms of building communities social connection dare i say even civil rebuilding civil society as well and actually learning in to revisit how we engage with each other in a society in a society that's in crisis. And, and lifestyles too. And how is it to spend time by yourself? Yeah. And, you know, that's, yeah. that's uh, 
you know, there's a famous saying that the Western man is uh, all his problems are sheeted back to the fact that they find it hard to sit in a room by themselves. What do we yeah. do when we're not endlessly busy? I would say one of the big answers to this is gardening, of course. Gardening is a, the great li literal and symbolic uh, activity of cultivation. So, you know, gardening is, is a fantastic thing to do. Lifestyle exercise in nature, if you can get, if you're allowed to get to nature. Yeah. Um, and then joining, into, joining in with co co community ventures of various sorts in some way or form. I was listening to uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, who is now at the University of Arizona and has grown, grown this ginormous beard, a magnificent beard, you know, bigger than Karl Marx's, I think. Um, wow. Anyway, anyway um, one of the things he was saying about the coronavirus, and, and he recognises it as a, as a global human and ecological tragedy, um, but he said that compared to what's coming, this might be just a, a sort of a rehearsal for what's coming, mm. because what we're looking at in terms of the climate emergency and, and the ecological crisis is a direct threat to organized human existence and to planetary existence. So to what degree do you see what's occurring now in, in towns like Bellingen and Arbor as a kind of preparatory exercise for, for what, we, what, what is coming? So one of our teachings that we bring up in most of our workshops is this idea of going back to core. So going in and, you know, Charlie said at the beginning of this, like once we have our, our systems in place, we'll be able to kind of reach out a bit more and be more helpful in our communities. Um, we're not first responder types. We're like the people who help you get prepared and we're like the people that help take care of and build the systems. Um, we're not the, the medics that are coming in to help. We um, want to help people prepare. And to be able to um, see what's going on and see people, you know, having to go back to core, to their families, to the day-to-days, to, -day, to their backyards, to their pets. Um, and to their sure partners. That, yeah, to their partners. <laughs> Make a pass. And making sure all those systems are kind of up and running and operational and working and then reaching out, okay, well, what's the next, how can I get my needs met within my neighborhood? Oh, we can all have a dance party in the street. Oh, my local farmer offers a pickup and I can just call them on Friday and pick it up on Saturday. Oh, you know, so-and-so offers this in my neighborhood and this is going on. And there's like a little library down the street that I can put food in. So one of my other neighbors maybe doesn't go hungry. You know, it's just kind of going back shrinking our awareness beyond the the huge you know the commutes and the next trips and the next vacations and the next 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 and focusing in on like on what's here and what's now and what are lo local resources so if this is a drill <laughs> well it's definitely very early days in this crisis certainly here in Bellingen it might be different in Milan or Madrid or Wuhan um, so whatever's coming next is likely to be much more challenging than this moment. I mean, it's kind of quiet in the air. People are waiting. The first cases of COVID-19 are in town. Um, many people I'm talking to have lost their jobs or their partners have lost their jobs or the mechanic says, you know, well, A, no, there are no tires for your car because they don't exist anymore. I can't get them. And B, I don't know if I'll be trading next week. You know, that's the main mechanic in town. Well, that's only going to, cascade down for a while the local bunnings apparently is going to close um you know what do australians do if they can't do things to their homes you know <laughs> like what are they going to do with themselves so um this is likely to cascade down for quite a while and it's going to get quite serious it's most likely you know it's not going to be this little suburban holiday that most people are experiencing at the moment because they still have some savings and you know so it's likely to be quite serious i mean food and security and and rights are all threatened in this moment. So it's very much gonna, not just a kind of a, a play out of something we thought might happen one day, it's gonna get very serious. And there are different levels of disaster too. I mean, what happens if some of these systems really break down, then what do we do? You know, do we go bush? Do we, how do we defend ourselves? So, and, and, and of course, systems break down. There's already was multiple systems break down occurring already. From, from Ann Arbor, Byron Bay, and Bellingen, these, were all, these are also quite privileged places. Mm -hmm. So multiple systems collapse is already occurring in, in India and other parts of Australia and the north of the UK and 
Richard Detroit Epsilon. and so on. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So yes, it yes it's and but often there's you know there's uh, there's there's a sense of what do you do? Well, you just do more of what you're already doing. You do it better, I think. If, as long as your practice was good in the first place, we'll deepen it. Yeah, yeah. Something quite chilling, uh, a comment from Josh Frydenberg, a quite innocuous comment, actually. He said that this, to fix this, to get back to the state we were in, in inverted commas, um, it's going to take generations. And then, then the, 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 my line of thought then was, well, okay, we're still being driven by the ethos of economic growth. How are they going to get back to this? Well, obviously, by lowering corporate taxes, by ensuring the interests of the corporate elite, by gutting public services. So what we might be faced with in the future, and this might be our next conversation, is a world in which uh, neoliberal capitalism is going to run riot even more. Um, there will be the emergence of alternative social movements. We don't quite know what form or what scale those will take, if they're going to be how much larger than they are than the present ones. But we're also going to be facing the climate ecological crisis. So we're going to have a perfect storm of interlocking forces which are going to make life really difficult for a lot of people. That's my sense. Yes. I read a book many, many years ago, when first, my first go at university, Hugh Stretton, he was writing about uh, capitalism, socialism and the environment. And I was, think it was part of a sociology course I was doing at the time before I let, dropped out and became a landscape gardener and a community uh, market gardener. And he said his, his argument was basically was that there is absolutely no reason why uh, uh, ecological future is going to be socialist or liberal. No reason. The most likely outcome, his argument was, this is from the 70s, is some kind of eco-fascist future. So e ecological principles, but enforced and rationed and through uh, hard right authoritarian government. That's the most likely outcome of things. So I think that needs to be clear. There's no, no reason to think we aren't heading towards that. And we need to be clear that's where these things are heading towards and we need to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. My particular reality right now, I want to hold on to hope. I, I hear you guys and I believe you and I understand that's what we have to steer away from. Um, and I've been really focused on continuing to do good works, like you know, go plant the trees, build the food forests, take care of my body, take care of my kids, take, you know, care of my loved ones. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's because this has, this has gone so much farther, so much faster than we can, Charlie and I really ever thought possible. We, you know, like you said, we, we understood that we were in precarious times, um, but this, I think I'm still in a bit of uh, a state of shock over it and kind of mm -hmm. adapting to this moment. So um, I'm aware that things could head in that direction. And I guess I also um, know things that you know, thinking about moving forward is like, how can we engage collectively and with enough um, voice and power and thoughtfulness to to take action? Um, everything that's gone on over the last month, um, globally and within our, you know, the U.S. and Australia, the places I've been, um, has been reactionary. Has, there hasn't been thoughtful preparedness going on. Um, there, there was a lot of information, you know, or enough information early on to change the outcome of the situation even within this moment, let alone in six weeks, six months, six years from now. Um, and to take this reactionary approach that um, has happened um, on the, you know, governmental and bureaucratic level is, is, is shocking and, um, I guess, you know, my desire and what I hope to see come of this is that we can all collectively as a people um, that are being supposedly represented to be able to find a voice and to find power to speak up so that we can uh, encourage thoughtful preparedness within our leaders and within our communities. Yeah. I agree. It's a def definite moment for very positive approaches to life. I agree with that. So in case, in case I implied that wasn't the case, it absolutely <laughs> is the case. Yeah. yeah Sorry, I agree too. 
agree too. Yeah. And uh, even in the midst of what we're facing, there's huge capacity for joy and joyfulness and connection. Thank you, yeah. Bridget from Ann Arbor, and thank you, Charlie um, and Ballingen. I really appreciate your really thoughtful, intelligent um, contributions. And um, I'm going to pass this as a link on to people in Resilient Byron. Uh, but with your permission, um, I wouldn't mind posting it on the Nagara Institute's uh, website as well, so people can share this conversation too. Um, and the other thing I might do is actually send off links to your websites and um, which set out all the wonderful work you're both doing so people can know where you're at and, and what you're up to. Sounds great, Richard. Thank you for a good chat in, yeah. in difficult you. times. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Richard, for engaging with us and having this conversation. It was wonderful to chat with you. Thanks, Bridget. Lovely seeing you again. It really is. And uh, a virtual hug to you and a virtual hug to Charlie. <laughs> yes, you can do. All right. Okay. Thank you. Take care, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.